Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Transportation Insights, the podcast where we dive into the hottest freight market topics, trends, and insights for ocean and air. I'm your host, Peter Sand, Chief Analyst at Senada, and I am delighted to welcome you to this special edition of Transportation Insights, where we literally bring back a dear old friend of ours, the Transportation Inside podcast, but do a special for you in talking about the 2023 outlook for ocean shipping and air freight. I am spoiled today in the recording room with some good and insightful colleagues from Sinetta. And please, if I may ask each one of you just to give a brief round of own introduction. Who are you? What do you do? And should we know anything special about you? Please, Emily, lead the way. So I'm Emily. I'm a market analyst here at Zanata covering mostly ocean and a little bit of air. I've been here for a year, um, but I'm not sure I'm willing to reveal too much more about that at this stage. Copy that. Neil, how about you? Why are you here? Thank you, Peter. So my name is Neil van der Waal, based in Amsterdam. And when Zanetta, I'm the chief air freight officer. And I'm the newest kid on the block, if I look around. Uh, I joined uh, Zanetta earlier this year. And I really love your tie, Neil. That sets the stage for Patrick. Thank you, Peter. So uh, my name is Patrick Berglin, and I'm the founding CEO of Zanetta. And uh, picking up on what Neil said, I'm the oldest kid on the block, which uh, gives me great pleasure. Um, yeah, delighted to be here, Peter. Thanks for putting this all together. I am looking very much forward to pick your brain. And just to set the scene for everyone, what we are about to hear today, and perhaps even also for some to see today, is a debate where I will present my top seven list in terms of the factors that will definitely impact the markets in 2023, considering ocean and air freight and the impact that will be felt by the shippers and BCOs, the carriers and freight forwarders. So the way that we go about this is that we will do this countdown from seven all the way to the top of the rankings, ending this conversation, debating which factor will be the most important one, the one that will disrupt the market, the one that will mean the most to the market, the one that will impact the direction of freight rates, regardless of anything else, as we go into the finale of the podcast. But of course, we cannot have a power ranking without having a common background for our debate. And please allow me to invite you back on center stage here, Patrick, just giving a little bit of insight into what kind of market do we see here as we speak towards the end of November? How do you see the market stage right now? What's going on? And when we have that tapestry in front of us, we can start debating on the factors that will then impact the current market. So please, Patrick, how do you see the ocean and air markets right now? Ooh, that's a great, uh, a great challenge to, to, to be handed. I'm going to try and keep it short in order to sort of not go into a rabbit hole here. But in essence, it's, it's, the market is in, in constant flux. And I would say that it's sort of like peak uncertainty at the moment because nobody anticipated what we've seen over the last, uh, I would say, nine, ten months where the market has sort of fallen off a cliff where carriers have had record profitability and now are again going back to fight for volumes but it's not only that the market has plummeted it's the fact that we're seeing certain things on the horizon like uh, inflation is still high interest rates uh, rates going up energy prices is elevated it's there's a lot of things that will hit consumer demand which again will uh, trickle uh, into how well businesses performs, which again threatens job security for a lot of people. And then you can have sort of this negative spiral over the next few quarters, which will make it very hard to be uh, an airline or a, a shipping line from a cargo point of view. Not only that, but also from a passenger point of view on, on the air freight side. And I, I love Neil's sort of perspective on, on how 
these two industries are so much similar, but yet so dramatically different where, where the air market is such a, a byproduct from another uh, industry, with, which is passengers. And that's why you got to look at consumer sentiment and, and expectations for consumption in order to understand what's going to hit these two modes of transportation over the coming quarters. So I think that p- paints a very high level picture of the current market that we're in and i would say uncertainty is what's ahead of us indeed and i think it's fair to add also that the whole game of procuring freight while well, buying and selling freight has changed from carriers saying hey this is take it or leave it option i can well deploy my capacity anywhere else with anyone else unless you just take it but now those carriers are basically come backing you for transporting volumes on half empty ships, depending on, of course, how capacity will be managed going forward. But because I guess, I mean, we could go into a conspiracy theory rabbit hole here, talking about all the conspiracies around the behavior of carriers. And I invite you guys on the panel just to chip in, not uh, not, uh, not 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 doing, say, any any, say, wrong accusations here, but just imagining how things could change or how behavior could play out from the individual actors in the market and look at the contracts will they be in breach will they be renegotiated again will we see more index linked contracts uh, coming up and will we see spot and contract market being on par at some time soon i mean trans pacific have a, a spread between spot and long around $5,000 right now. That's mind-boggling. Enough about the scene setting. Let's get down to the power ranking because this is a fireside chat and I'm getting roasted here if we do not proceed with the very first item on the power ranking. And in the seventh place on this power ranking because we're calling down or counting down from seven. Of course, the seven seas of the world including air. In seventh place, I have named regulation as the factor that will impact the markets going forward. I'm talking about the IMO 2023 regulation, the uh, CII, the EEXI. Just earlier in November, Senetta had our summit talking about the green agenda. This is something that impacts ocean as well as air. And if I if I may start by calling you out, Emily, because I know you are literally our expert on this new carbon emissions index also that, uh, that we have launched in November. How do you see regulation in seventh place? Uh, do you contest that uh, as, as, well, as, as you, you something wrong? You kindly have, have not shared with us the other factors on the list. So I can't say what else is coming, but I think it's, it's fair to put it there and it's fair not to put it too high. Given the situation we're in, right, if we were looking at this uh, last year and we saw this huge capacity, uh, the demand increase in capacity not being there to meet it, then the potential regulation and the potential effect it has on lowering the efficiency of the fleet would be a much bigger concern. But as it stands now, we don't see a capacity crunch being a problem. So if the capacity, if the fleet does become less efficient in, in a some way, that's that's fine because we have all the capacity we need to match the demand that, that's there. So it's, it's not really a huge concern in terms of what, what capacity is available. It might get a little bit more expensive, we'll see. But it, it's, um, it's not the biggest issue I see coming into, into next year, despite there still being a lot of uncertainty about it and, and carriers making a lot of noise about it. But, but that's what they do often on these, on these topics. Yeah, I can come with the statement here that I, I believe it's an insignificant uh, factor when it comes to ocean freight rates. And I'll, I'll give my two cents. Um, and it's the following, that since we started Sonata, I've seen rates on, let's say, Asia to Santos, ranging from $20,000 to $50. It's a pure result of how, what, what kind of equilibrium or a lack of equilibrium you have between supply and demand. And when IMO 2020 was on everybody's radar two years prior to sort of it coming into effect, everybody anticipated increased rates now it will potentially be increased cost for the shipping lines. 
but cost is not the decisive factor for where the rates sit. You can see that through COVID. You can see it as per today on the short-term rates plummeting below $1,000 per FEU on the, the Trans-Pacific Westbound or the lower end of the market. So from my point of view, we keep our eyes on that, but more interestingly is to see whether this industry can really push and transform and change so that their footprint is reduced, but whether that will mean higher or lower rates, I don't believe I, so. I think you're totally right, right? But but there is a difference between the IMO 2020 and, and what's coming in next year because IMO 2020 was a simple solution. You buy more expensive fuel or you, or you get a scrubber, right? This this new regulation can't quite be met in that way. So if we were looking at another demand and, and supply picture, then I would be more concerned about it. But but as it stands now, it's it's simply not something that I see having an effect on on shippers. And and when we talk rates, we talk about the demand between supply and capacity, and that's not something that this this new regulation is going to put under under pressure next year. Simon, how does this regulation theme impact the air freight market, if at all? Ah, uh, the. Uh, the airborne carriers completely immune to a regular a regulatory tsunami that is, is facing the ocean carriers. Or, or how do you see it, Neil? I don't think we have a um, comparable IMO regulation in the aviation industry. Um, there's a lot of talk um, and uh, effort and investment with regards to SAF fuels, uh, if that uh, rings a bell. So let's say... Uh, greener fuel so SAF fuels it's um, sustainable aviation fuels I think it's the abbreviation uh, if I'm not mistaken what it, what it means in fact is that it's uh, it's less polluting far less polluting than it's a traditional kerosene um, but the, the, the overall uh, production facilities um, is just a fraction of what the uh, the daily demand is so the impact is minimal I think the regulations indirectly could impact uh, the air freight industry from a demand point of view. That uh, the ESG, uh, which is a big topic, uh, the E for environment, uh, that uh, shippers are becoming more and more cost conscious, uh, the pressure from investors, uh, and therefore being very critical uh, on, on their uh, the logistics footprint, uh, which will differ, of course, per producer, um, which would put uh, yeah, ocean, you know, in, in favor of air w with regards to footprint. So I could see it more, not so much from a cost point of view, but more from a demand point of view. Uh, but I would not put it in my top three. I hear you. I hear you. And I certainly also hear that sustainable fuels, I mean, it, it may be that uh, that we will also learn more about what the sustainable fuels actually mean because Senator customers will surely also know that not all methanol is equal in a customer only report that we have just shared with you on the green transition of the container shipping fleet. So definitely watch out for the regulation, even though I think we can, uh, we can see there's a bit of consensus in the panel, at least that it's not the most important factor around, but let's move into six position. I call out COVID-19 and geopolitics in sixth place of the power ranking because to me, it remains an unknown factor. We could still, I mean, a black swan and black swan events in general could be in, in sixth place here because of course, we, we the, the unknown unknowns, as uh, Secretary Rumsfeld uh, once put it, uh, will, will surely also impact. 2023 for ocean and and air and we have just seen most like uh, most uh, predominant in, uh, in in Guangzhou China uh, an ongoing three weeks uh, lockdown of at least half the city impacting supply chains also globally so 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 let me hear you guys uh, I have COVID-19 and geopolitics in sixth place How but I, I heard you say unknown unknowns as well in sixth place mm -hmm. and and that's where I have I'm not sure I can, I mean, I can both agree and disagree to put it in six, right? Because you don't know. So it could be the thing that standing here in a year's time, we're saying this is what made the whole market in 2023 and we have no idea. So maybe it's far too low that it's in sixth place and maybe it's, it's not. A fair point. It, with regards to COVID, I think it's kind of the same as with the new regulation, right? If we we're in a different situation, it'd have a much bigger impact. If, if, if we we're in a situation where demand was still high in the rest of the world, then the fact that a large share of China was in lockdown now would be a huge problem. 
but as it is today, it's not because the demand's not there, even if they were, were more open. So I think it's, it's really hard to place that one on the list um, because we have no idea really how it will develop into 2023 and, and none of us sitting here can, can make an educated guess, I don't think, unless, unless there's something I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Could I make an educated guess? Go for it, Neil. It's, it's not so much a guess, but it's if it will happen, I think the chances are high that it will be local. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be very unlikely that we'd have a, a, the same global impact that we have seen in the past. Um, uh, and, uh, and then we focus on China. So there but will definitely hit. be an increased focus on, say, the local disruptions that uh, that will cause more problems for those that are uh, shipping goods in and out of, of that region. But we will not necessarily see it as a as an industry wide issue. Is that uh, how I hear you? I think that that would be a fair assessment, and that would uh, the, the slight nuance that will be uh, China is a big country. Uh, you know, it's. For air freight, it's it, it's called the, the factory of the world uh, in, in many in many cases. So it could have profound impact for individual companies uh, still there. But I would not see COVID impacting, um, let's say, the Atlantic or other markets, um, for that matter. If I may add on to that, uh, Neil, uh, because China International Long Haul Air capacity is still only at 10 percent to pre-covid levels so there's really some improvements you might uh, call it from from absolute almost insignificant in the market to a uh, to to a pre-covid level uh, so so all eyes on china for sure on uh, on that um allow me to bring you into fifth place hold on hold, hold on peter hold on for a second i, I gotta ask you when you say ge geopolitical do you also take into account, for instance, the, the war in Ukraine, or is it this geopolitical circumstances re related to COVID only? I think we're absolutely allowed to embrace it all, including a potential, uh, say, occupation of, of Taiwan uh, by China in, uh, in the Far East that will definitely also disrupt supply chains as we know them today and, and make, for sure, bigger waves than uh, the, uh, the the war in, in Ukraine right now. But it seems as if you have more on the war in Ukraine that you want to share with us, Patrick. It, it, this is, uh, this is uh, why I'm excited to see the rest of your list, because if we <laughs> it, it, it extrapolate geopolitical uh, sort of circumstances to be broader than COVID, which I think we should if it's not apparent uh, uh, on the list at uh, first or second or third place, then, then I would argue that that's the big X factor to me personally. I would, I, I would rank it top three. And here's the reason, because if, if the carriers now start to uh, uh, take out capacity from the market and we get a surprise from uh, the war coming to an end and consumer sentiment shifting dramatically to something way more positive and spending comes quicker, more quickly back than we anticipated, that would be on a market that has reduced capacity and it would kind of create the, not an equivalent, but it would create the same mechanisms as we saw when COVID hit, right? Where the carriers, uh, the capacity is pulled, all of a sudden there's a rush and need for more goods to be moved. And that's why I think it can have such a huge impact and, and, and a critical X factor for, for next year by far bigger than whether there's some local shutdowns uh, related to COVID in, in, in China. But is the is the war in Ukraine an ending enough for that? I mean, I agree it would have a positive positive effect, but I can't see it resulting in the same chaos we've had for the past eighteen months. Uh, it, it's it's not. I don't think it's enough. That's a fair point, and I, I somewhat agree with you, Emily. But but if if that does something with energy prices, as 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 one example, or um, food prices, or if it pushes certain key uh, levers that changes consumer spending and what we have sort of available to spend, that's where I'm thinking that it can not only create a psychological sort of positivity, but also in reality free up some capital, and that can create a, a, a market that is strained for capacity if they have pulled out enough. And surely this must have been great for the carriers again, and then again we would see a market booming. Could I chip in, Peter? Please, uh, please do, Neil. I've been cheating a little bit, and I've been preparing myself for this conversation. So well I, looked, I looked at, and 
people that have attended uh, webinars that I participate in often hear me ref refer to The Economist. So I had a look there and they have, you know, the 10 trends to watch out for 2023. Oh, okay. And that's really hang cheating. On, hang on. I know, but I still want, we should bring in outside perspectives as well. Please. And their number one, all eyes on Ukraine. They think mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's a single uh, development, uh, I'm not going to mention the other nine. For now, we'll keep it in my pocket. But that was their their number one uh, because of all the for a um... job with them. Don't quit your day job, uh, Patrick. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> We'd like to I keep mean... you on board for a long, a little while longer, Patrick. <laughs> FT uh... will surely pay attention to this podcast, and they will hear you out. But, um... but, uh, but, but don't <laughs> I... go anywhere, please. So, so I, I tend to agree with, with Patrick that you know, if that would that could be such a profound change uh, uh, in Europe. Um, but I, I have no I doubt think... it, will, it will lead to an increase. I just can't see it leading to what we've been through again. I think there's, there's, there's not, I mean, they're not going to start sending checks out again, right? And people aren't going to be stuck at home. So they'll have more money and they'll spend more than they are now. But it's not going to be that same level of increase that we saw in the second half of 2020 no. and 2021. That I agree with you, Emily. I fully do. But uh, I think out of all the things I could sort of come up with, that would be the one bigger sort of um, positive surprises that could uh, impact this market, especially if it's like blue mill over the next quarter or two, and then that would change uh, the market. And, and, and yeah. I hear you guys. And, uh, and uh, okay, you're consisting surely in the sixth position of, of geopolitics and, <laughs> yeah. and COVID-19, even bringing in the ammo from, from FT, uh, uh, cheating or not, uh, I don't care. I think, uh, I think you're, you're delivering a solid case here. And then allow me to jump into the number five, because we're moving into, a, a, say, a measurable metric here. Uh, I have in fifth place the schedule reliability of ocean shipping services, the positiveness of predictability. Will that be a negative to air freight demand? Will we see limited delays around? Will this actually be a benefit for everyone that schedule reliability gets to a higher level. I mean, we must also realize that it's not a one-sided bet here. Global schedule reliability actually came down in September following month of improvements. So there's definitely still rocks and bumps on the road. Uh, but, but how do you guys see schedule reliability as a factor that will move and shake the market in, in, in 2023. Neil, if I may point to you up front, because, because I know this, uh, this, this is one thing that you also pointed out at the Senator Summit. I don't agree with your number five position on this one for air freight. <laughs> I think it's higher. I hear you. I hear you. I you think, think it's, it's higher. higher. And, yeah, um, I think it's more relevant to that. And in my introduction, I said it was a new kid on the block. Yeah, we're in Zanetta. But I've been in the industry for quite a while longer than that. And what I learned in the last 11 months, uh, having countless conversations with BCOs, how much more intertwined ocean and air is. And that in the end, it's a, a human being, people like us, that decides I'm going to go by air or I'm going to go by ocean with my shipments. Uh, so that those are, uh, those, those are human considerations. And a big component of that is, can I get my stuff there in time? And with the unprecedented low reliability on the ocean side, that really boosted air freight in the last 18 months. And, you know, and, we, and we have stats to prove that. Uh, when ocean reliability goes down, you see uh, air freight rates, spot rates go up. Uh, which makes sense. And um, I would expect in 2023, um, depending on how many blank sailings there will be on the ocean side, because if, if they start really pulling back and it becomes a mess again, uh, then we wouldn't see that swing a bit back to air. Uh, but assuming that uh, weaker demand will push up reliability, I could see that dampening uh, the air freight growth in 2023. And like I said, I would rank it higher than position number five. 
I can add on to that for air freight personally uh, as reliability uh, continues to sort of move upwards and demand softens and companies would be looking for cost saving initiatives. That's a very natural place to look, right? How can I shift some of my volumes from air into ocean and that will further, you know, be an opportunity as re reliability ticks up. So <clears throat> I, from my point of view, I would place it as a significant element for air, but, but less significantly for ocean itself. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I mean, especially now we, we've reached, we've not reached a good level, but we're at about 50% now thereabouts. It's, it's not as critical as it was earlier. The, the risk is it goes wrong again. The risk is we have a strike on the US West Coast or the railways go, go on strike or whatever the case, and we get these local conditions that mean that on certain trade lanes, it really, it really gets bad. And then you have air freight maybe winning out a bit on that. But, but if that's not the case and we don't have these sort of shocks that, that, that isn't to do with, with the carriers themselves or, or shipping demand itself, then, then I don't see scheduled reliability being the huge, huge factor anymore. If I may add on to just what maybe put uh, it Neil just uh, said uh, before. I hear you, Neil, but, uh, but uh, I just want to add on top of what you said before that uh, we also hear from a lot of retailers that, uh, that they are literally being banned from using uh, air cargo. So are we perhaps in for a, for a double whammy here, even though air freight rates are also coming down, they're still much elevated from pre-COVID levels, whereas uh, ocean shipping freight rates find itself, at least for, for, for selected trades, uh, back at, at where they once were. Uh, do you want to add something on that, Neil? Yeah, just just um, to give you a reference number. Uh, uh, we had our, um, our customer summit in Hamburg two weeks ago. And I spoke uh, to a firm, and they mentioned that on average, looking at the last decade, roughly 5% of their volumes moved by air, 95% uh, by ocean. Last year was 20%, 20, because of the mess. Uh, that, 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 I mean, that says it all. Um, and they're working hard to bring that number back down again, uh, closer to the five. And there'll be many, many of those examples which will not, um, and which will dampen uh, the growth perspectives of air freight in 2023. On that note, uh, and thanks for putting up those numbers, I hear also from freight forwarders talking about some retailers shedding 90% of the cargo that they expected to move also. Uh, so, uh, so definitely uh, a factor to watch out for, mostly the impact of it, uh, I would I would say. So general reliability for ocean services in fifth place, in fourth position, if I may. And 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 Emily, you literally just jumped the gun on this uh, a while ago, because I have the ILWU and PMA discussions on the U.S. West Coast here. They are still debating a new deal that should tack uh, along to the one that expired on 1st July earlier this year. So, I mean, Emily, uh, give us your thoughts on, on this one. Why do you think ILWU and PMA discussions uh, should be so high on, on the ranking? I have them in fourth place. Are you maybe, maybe they should, place? maybe they shouldn't. And maybe they should for shippers. I think for shippers in, you know... It, it's, it, it's kind of the same again as with the geopolitics and with the unknown unknowns. If it goes wrong, then it should be higher. And if it just resolves smoothly, then it shouldn't be on the list. And we just don't know. So, so maybe that's why you've averaged it out and given it a fourth place. But I think, you know, there, is, there are signs that it's not going particularly well. There are also signs that actually they're still negotiating and, and we'll figure it out. But we don't know the effect. So, so, you know, I think it's fair it's on the list, but I, I'm not willing to, to say it should be higher. Um, come back to me when they go on strike and I'll, I'll put my neck out there. But, but, but just now, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say just how much of an impact it has because we, we don't really have much insight into, into what's going on behind the, the closed doors they've got. Ports, terminals and longshoremen basically hold the key on on this one but uh, but we definitely also know from from shippers and bcos that that they kind of stick to the volumes that they ship in on the u.s east coast right now because they still see a lot of uncertainty and potential disruptions and, and, and that, on the you know coast. we saw it with the rail in the, in the first is, uh, instance of the strike that the administration stepped in and, and negotiated a deal 
is that something they're, they're willing to do should it go wrong on oceans, on the, on the port side as well? You know, I, I have no insight into that. So it's, it's hard to know really what, if it goes wrong, how wrong it goes and how long is it, is it allowed to last for? Um, but these are all known unknowns. So, uh, so I, I fully agree with you in the sense that, uh, that we do not need to look as far as 2023 for these disruptions. Uh, by 8 or 9 December, we may have a railroad strike in the U.S. Time will only tell how disruptive that will be. Please allow me to jump into the podium right now. And in the third place, I will not open the floor in due consideration of, of the time, but I really like all the aspects that you share here. But in third position, allow me to, to take this one as a solo because I have seasonality here in third position. And, and you... and. Of course, I encourage you to, uh, to to argue with me, but not on this one. Seasonality could be dwarfed completely by the geopolitics that we have seen. But if there's something that should turn around this black and bleak outlook for 2023, it should be the seasonalities. We have Chinese Lunar New Year coming around uh, January 22nd. We have the traditional Q3 peak season and just look back a few months from now carriers were ramping up capacity to a third quarter that was still highly unknown in terms of demand right now we see bloated inventories what kind of say impact will that seasonality factor have on 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 rates and and and, and that should definitely not be mistaken for a brain dead cyclicality approach i just say okay I'll put my neck out then and my two cents into the conversation, having a sole call for seasonality in third place. Second only to one. We are now revealing the runners-up in the power ranking of the factors that will impact the markets for ocean shipping and air freight in 2023. And in second place, I have chosen container shipping capacity. Fleet growth net impact, demolition, idling of the fleet. How well can carriers postpone slash delay the delivery of new buildings? How will congestion unfold? What about blank sailings? This whole, say, capacity management, this is where conspiracies have been around for a while now because it seems as if the big menace is the carrier's capacity management ability or the lack of it. I contest that with you and, and invite you to, uh, to, 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 to argue with me in second place here. Container shipping capacity or belly capacity that is going up as passenger traffic also recovers. How do you see that in second place? That was quickly. I take it that you all agree. <laughs> now, Patrick, please. It's hard to debate that one because I, I, I believe that's the... It, it's nicely put. Now I'm super curious at, at, on what is more important than that single factor because whatever the carrier does here is going to dictate their foundation and ability to jack up prices. So I think you... I think you painted the picture very nicely, uh, Peter, to be honest. And I, I I, would be surprised if number one can be more important than this. I think Emily from my Neal? side, you did a good good job not opening the floor on seasonality because I'm not sure I quite agree on that one. But but sticking to, to Kavasti, <laughs> I, I, I agree with Patrick that I, I, if I have to guess now, you're going to say demand in the first one. And and even even that, I think, is, is not as important. I would, I would swap those two around if, if that's the case because capacity is... That's that's the question, right? There's a limit for how much demand can can be changed and how much and where we're going. Whereas capacity, they have an awful lot of money in the bank. They they can afford to leave those ships idle. Um, yes, demolition will increase, but but that's not a, a big factor when you see all the new ships coming in. It, it's really it's up to them how much they decide to reduce, and they have the power to reduce so much that that even whatever happens in demand won't be enough to to take away that that power from them. And they have the learning from COVID. They, they've seen how much the balance here can make it sort of create an opportunity for them to print money. So it would be, and, and you said it, Emily, they have the funding to do dr drastic choices and, and um, take drastic action. So, so well, on yeah, the other think... side, they have the funding to say, I want all the volumes I can get 
we know some carriers have been very, very aggressive in ordering and getting capacity in. And maybe they're saying, well, you know, I do have the money, so I'm willing to lose money for the next year and a half, two years, if it means I can I can get all the volumes I need and, and make sure I have the market power when, when rates become profitable. So there is True, a flip side to that. De- but again, that's still of, capacity. Of, uh, so you're yeah. not saying it's a limited capacity, you're just saying capacity management. Yeah, but decades of sort of uh, uh, shipping lines, and uh, Neil, you can you can talk about the uh, carriers here. Decades of of not making almost any money must have given them a huge appetite to to go on and and you know perform better overall uh, over the coming years than what they did in the they past. They have a little bit of a. I hope for their sake at least, they have a little bit of an eye on regulation, and they have a lot of of notice mm-hmm. taken on them. So if they go too far. And that's yeah. really how they're making the money. Then, then they come under too much scrutiny. Then they risk the future, right? So yeah. there is, they have to keep an eye on that as well. In in my view, if they want it to to hold for for the future. Yeah, I don't disagree with that either. Well put. What do you think, Neil? There's such a big difference between air and ocean. Um, on the on the airline side, um, it's much more fragmented. So you don't have the large alliances that you see on the ocean side, eh, dictated by a few groups. So it's a lot more fragmented. So there's no, eh, there, there, there are no conspiracy thoughts, at least I haven't heard of them, on the airline side because it's much more fragmented. Secondly, what, 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 what's a big difference? Imagine that on the ocean side that you would have these cruise ships that would move half of the containers that need to go from A to B. Because that's what's happening in air freight. Eh? Half of the supply is on passenger planes. And they will fly, you know, whether they will fly 10 times a week to Cancun, whether there's air freight or not, they will do so if there's passenger demand. So there's far less control on the capacity side than there is uh, uh, than on the ocean side. So, Neil, does this mean also that the spot market freight rates and the contract freight rates will finally fall to uh, to pre-pandemic levels, perhaps even lower i mean they are highly elevated right now i mean the picture that you paint for us is that belly capacity will will continue to rise and demand may even contract so so how does that spill into to rates what's keeping them so high well they they've been declining but not as they've not been falling off a cliff um as we've seen on the ocean side but they've been i mean a, a perfect example everybody predicted that the atlantic market would return uh, the so- soonest um, because of the increase of passenger flights uh, relative to other markets. And the rates have been in a steady decline. They're still higher than they were pre-COVID, um, but they're, uh, they're substantially lower already than, than earlier this year. Um, on that, may, may I take another trump card from the Economist study? Because I, I just love the way how they phrased it. They call it revenge, revenge tourism and taking revenge on COVID, eh? being locked uh, down for two years. I, I can't use the word here, but it starts with an F. Eh? COVID, I'm going to travel. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, that will bring more and more people up into the air, bring back the belly capacity, uh, and, and, would, and will bring additional supply completely non-related to any kind of demand. And I think that will that will create a downward pressure on rates in 2023. As somebody, the whole COVID, then I'll, then I'll stop. That the 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 summary is the supply stupid, as somebody phrased it. That 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 is the summary of COVID because there was so much supply taken out of the market that boosted up the rates, that increased the margins and the profits. It was the supply. There you have it. The tie has spoken. It is all about the supply, stupid. Leading also the way to the very top position on this power ranking. The one to rule them all. And I'm not talking about the ring here. I'm talking about cost of living crisis, a.k.a. consumer demand. Impacted from left, right and center. Patrick literally started on that note and allow me to bring the full circle here. Inflation rates are high, though they are coming down in US, still on the rise in Europe. Energy prices may find a, say, a new normal 
if the war in Russia and the, say, at least the Western outrage and outfall with Russia still will impact uh, demand and energy prices going forward. So for consumer demand to take first place, anyone want to contest that? I think we contested it already. Uh, I almost guessed it right. I think it's right to be up at the top, but it's not it's not the most important variable when, when, when we compare it to capacity as well. Um, there's a range for it to be both negative and positive, but it's a range that's relatively sort of narrow compared to, to the possibilities with, with capacity in my view. Uh, connect a few of them uh, and, and say that I, I'd like to switch spots on the top two and then hit uh, geopolitical as number three uh, in terms of what we've gone through. Let's have VA to, to look at this or, or may, check may out I, the photo I, finish. Hang on, hang <laughs> because on, I, hang on, Peter. Hang on. May I, Neil. May I steer a little bit here? Because um, Emily and Patrick, I think in all their wisdom, were talking about the ocean side. Um, I would like to, I think I would concur that it's number one for me for 2023 on the air freight side. And why do I think that? Um, Again, referring back to our customer summit in Hamburg two weeks ago, I asked the audience, and this was freight forwarders, BCOs, partners of Senator, a very mixed bag from different parts of the world. I asked them, please raise your hand if you think that consumer demand in Europe and the US in 2023 will be lower than in 2022. And then I asked everybody, just look around you. Nearly everybody was raising their hand. Yeah, so, so that is, as a starting point, uh, I think it's unlikely that there'll be that people will be buying the same amount of goods um, in 2023 than they bought in 2022. On that note, again, this this isn't cheating, but I did a quick look. Um, this recording, <laughs> by the way, is the day before Black Friday. And that is an indication of how, what's happening with the economy. And the latest uh, analysis is that they expect a flattish or low single-digit improvement versus 2021. While in 2021, it was up more than 13% versus 2020 itself. So we see, uh, we, we, we see that flattening. The fact uh, that combined with... Uh, even even if people would have the same amount to spend, which I would doubt, they will start spending more on services. Right? The, let's say the revenge tourism, so it'll be less for air freight, uh, and then the shift more towards ocean. Yeah, I I would struggle to see a world where we would see more demand for air freight in 2023 than we have seen in 2022. Just for the, uh, the experts among us, I'm talking about the general air freight market and not about the small parcel business. Neil van der Waal, Emily Stausbull, and Patrick Berglund, thank you so much for joining me for this fireside chat. As you see, it is not a fake bonfire behind me. I'm almost sweating here. So I don't know about you, but... I have certainly enjoyed picking your brains and, and hearing your arguments in favor or against this power ranking of the seven most important factors to look out for for ocean shipping and air freight rates in 2023. And to everyone listening all over the world, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you have enjoyed this podcast slash webcast and don't forget to subscribe rate review and of course recommend us and please do also note that we will be back next month with a brand new episode of transportation insights thanks to all for your kind attention and thank you so much for all the brilliant insightful thoughts from the panelists take thank care you, and have a great 2023 thank you